Okay, so now we're coming next to the period from 86 to 104 AD. And I've already done the history on what Paul is doing with it, with the Roman emperors. So here I'm going to focus instead on just the, the topical application that Peter's making to the words. Here in Peter we got the words. That's covering from, you know, 86, 87, really, to 104 A.D. Here in Paul, still looking at the enjambment here, okay, agape, so it's all tied together, it's linked. That's what enjambment does, is it links the verses together more closely and stresses the cause of their linkage by means of love, okay? But in the actual syllables of the text, you're looking at there. Well, technically, the way Greek works, I have to break it here. Okay? Klistu. Now, that's really significant that it's broken that way because klistu means anointed. Okay? Just the prefix, kris, means anointing, anointed, oil. Okay, and that's really important considering what the text is going to say. The key word in Paul here is huiotesian, and in Paul's satire on the Roman Empire, he's picking, he's using this uh, term here because he's covering the adoptive emperors, where they adopted their sons, whether the sons were related to them or not. Okay, it's called the Golden Age in many uh, Roman historians consider this the golden age of Rome. Okay, so I'd already covered that though when I covered this in the GGS series uh, episodes 11a and following. So I'm not going to cover that ground again here. Just notice the text. First of all you've got the enjambment of agape at the beginning of, of the first black line. And the translation would be by means of love he foreordained us into his airship, sonship, through Jesus Christ. Quiotesian means airship as well as sonship. There are two sides of a coin. If you were adopted as a son, you were considered the heir. You got the toga virilis at age 15, and then if your father was adopting you as his son to be his heir, then um, there was a special ceremony to do that in Roman culture. So that's the theme of what Paul's writing. So now let's look at what Peter's writing. Peter, covering the same period, is saying, according to his great mercy, he rebirthed us. Now, what's so clever about this, and unfortunately it's not as well known as it should be, anaginao is usually translated be born again, but that's not really what the Greek word means. It means sire. Genao means to sire, so it's referencing fatherhood, not so much the sonship, but the fathering, okay? When you see born again, it's almost universally should be translated sired again. In other words, you had biological parents, but your real father is God, okay? And that's the theme that runs from Genesis 2-7 forward, but the stress is on fathering here. You get that pun, don't you? Between fathering and sonship here. You see the pun? The father appoints his heir. The father appoints his son. Jesus Christ is the first son, the first fruits. You see the, the funky little cuteness of that? Okay, according to his great mercy, he sired us. Sired us in who? Sired us in Christ because of Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ. For ordained to be in sonship through Jesus Christ. So what does that tell you? That tells you that the Father has great mercy. Okay? It was his great mercy to sire us again, because he sired us the first time too by giving us a soul at birth. Okay? Who according to his great mercy, he sired us again. Again in who? Christ. See how close this is? So now, looking at the same period of history, which is covering now from 87, really from here, all the way to here, <clears throat> the anointing, 
all right? You can start reading this in Paul, taking an agape to be the beginning, because it's overlapped. By means of love, he foreordained us into his heirship, sonship through Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, Father, still is the subject of the sentence, he rebirthed us. Isn't that cute? Or now we can read it in reverse. That's why these texts sound so syrupy and sort of disjointed, because they're meant to be used antiphonally or they're meant to be used as timeless, always true statements. Okay? But here we're referencing a particular period of time, the adoptive emperors. Okay? So now if we read Peter first, who according to his great mercy he rebirthed us in love, he foreordained us into sonship, heirship by means of Jesus Christ. Jesus the anointed. You don't even have to say two. You know who it was. If you're tying exactly to 104 AD. All right, now, the reason why this is so important is that our boy uh, Domitian is going to die. This is really hysterical. When I, when I first saw this, I almost died. I covered this already in the Ephesians videos in the GGS series. Ice Hui. Okay, that's when Domitian dies. Domitian was the guy who exiled John on Patmos. Domitian in Domitian's day, and it was something of, I guess, he liked it. Um, but it was very popular to make plays that were mime plays burlesquing Christians. That's why you see so much of, of a mind play theme in the book of Revelation, where it's talking back to the popular custom at the time that John was writing of mind plays. But the mind plays in Roman Empire were burlesquing Christians, and now God is answering back to that burlesque by pronouncing judgment by means of the mind plays. you got mind plays in Revelation um, uh, Revelation 11, Revelation 12, Revelation 13. Okay, and so this is kind of, you know, a dig at the Romans, okay? The Romans were all about sonship and heirship, okay? That was, you know, your adopted son from a Roman patriarch, that was a really big deal, and he wouldn't necessarily adopt his physical son, okay? Just because you were of his blood doesn't mean that he adopted you to have it to be an heir. So in the time that Paul was writing and Peter is talking back to, this is really important. He's, he's basically communicating that there is a, a whole huge amount of wealth in salvation. Okay, There's a whole huge amount of inheritance in salvation, which of course is the theme of Peter's letter. Okay, Who according to his great mercy, he rebirthed us in love by means of love, having foreordained us into heirship, sonship, through Jesus Christ. See, that's a complete thought. And it's covering a time period when that was a real big deal. That was what the Roman emperors were actually doing. So this would have had a lot of resonance to people living at the time. Whether they were, you know, Peter is writing his letter and Paul's writing his letter in 56, 66 and 56 respectively, or 68 and 58 respectively. And that was a real big deal in the Roman Empire at the time they wrote. It was an even bigger deal during the years 87 through 104. Because that was a, an established custom of Roman emperors to adopt somebody as their son while the emperor was still alive. That helped assure continuity. Augustus was trying to, you know, do that practice, but he always had bad luck with it, finally going with Tiberius. Okay, so this thing of airship is tied to rebirthing you. It, Peter's tying that concept to the airship before the foundation of the world in Christ. You see how clever that is? Okay, now, I've got one more segment I'm going to do on this. I'm not going to cover all of how Peter talks back to Paul, but I need to show you just the pattern, and then I'm going to leave you to do this yourself. We've got one more segment, and then I'm going to be done with this episode on how Peter is talking back to Paul. How do I turn? 
Okay, we've got one more increment, and that's this one, and it's going to be a little bit long because it's going to take a lot of explaining. Um, we're still showing about how the meter elucidates the text, and especially when you've got passages that have a similar meter or are talking deliberately back to each other, and you know that they are, how do you read the text in, in that kind of event? And I'm giving you ideas. Nothing I'm saying is final or you know completely definitive because there's always more that you can learn about this. I'm just giving you some brainstorming ideas so you can get a sense of the importance of the meter. Okay? Because nobody knows about this but me. And what if I die tomorrow? Okay, I'm sure God will hire somebody to carry on the torch, but I, I should care about it. So that's why I'm doing this. All right. Our passage now in question is this one which is starting at 105 A.D. and ending at 122 A.D., okay? And so that here is illustrated by this black highlighted text in Paul, okay, which is the last half of verse 5, Ephesians 1, 5, and it's, it ends at the very beginning of verse 6, which is the epinon anaphora. Now, I covered the epinon anaphora in great detail, it's an Appendix 1 of the Ephesians 1 Reparse Doc. Also, the PDF file is named FEPH 1 Decree Syllables Reparsed. Sorry about the funky name. Um, I go through these anaphora in Paul. It's extremely, extremely sophisticated. He's talking about autonomy in the Eudokian anaphora. He, anaphora means it's repeated three times. This key word and this key phrase are repeated three times in, in the Ephesians passage. And the question is why? What kind of rhetorical device is that? Nested within it, before the next eudokion occurs, is the Greek word epinon. Okay? And that means praise. And that's what um, Peter is going to address. All right? Not right away, but he's getting ready to do it. Okay? So that's why Peter's stopping right here just before the epinon begins. And the question is, what, what is Peter tracking now? How do we read this now? This covers the period from 104 AD all the way to 122, because that's where Peter ends down here. 122 AD, see, 122. Now Peter deliberately uses his own 56, mimicking Paul's initial 56, to make sure you know how to track what he's saying. And we've seen how what he's saying interleaves with what Paul said, even though the years that Paul was talking about were at first at least slightly different from the years Peter's addressing. But if you match up the syllables to the years, then you get some coherent thoughts that tell you very easily how to interpret what Paul is writing. And therefore, you know better what Peter is writing. Because Bible, law of non-contradiction, the Bible is always consistent with itself. Now see, this is a valuable t tool for any pastor giving a sermon, anybody in seminary trying to figure out how Bible is written, anybody trying to troubleshoot when Bible books were written. These are all valuable tools. And unfortunately, at this moment in time, I'm the only one on the planet who understands this which is why I'm spending the time with the videos, okay? Uh, I'm, it's as if I'm somebody's research assistant, only I don't know whose research assistant I am, and I'm supposed to do this till I'm dead, and somebody who's got credentials is going to pick this up someday, and they're going to run with it. So I'm supposed to do my job until I die, for whoever it ends up being. I don't need to know. All I need to know is I got an order from God to do it. So that's what I'm doing, okay? Enough of the autobiography. I shall be the son the Anastasios, Jesus Christ, and Ek Necron. That's the text. Into the confident expectation, LP, that should be translated confident expectation, not just hope. Into the confident living expectation due to the resurrection of Jesus Christ out from the dead ones. That black and gold text, that's how you translate it in more idiomatic English. Okay? We'll do it again, because if you're not familiar with the Greek, this is going to be kind of a slog for you. Into the confident expectation 
living, okay, into the confident living expectation because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ out from the dead ones. That's literal. Meaning the people, you know, he was he was dead, he went down to Hades, he proclaimed the gospel down there, and, and came back. I know that's in the Nicene Creed, but here it is in the Bible. I'm not a big fan of the Nicene Creed, but it's usually doctrinally correct. Okay? Let's do that one more time. Into the confident living expectation because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ out from the dead ones. Okay, reading it in Greek. I said, Pido, Sosan dia Anastasius. Jesu Christu ek necrum. Okay? Ice into Elpida, confident expectation. Zosan, living. Dia, because of, through, with reference to, but here it's because of. Anastasius, resurrection. Jesu Christu, of Jesus Christ. Ek, from, out from, really. Necrum, the dead ones. Okay? That takes you to 122 AD from 104 AD. The parallel text in Paul is right here. So that's a, the tag on Christ. So it's Christ. Into whom? See, here's another ice clause. See, Peter is paralleling the ice clauses, the intos. He's paralleling with Paul's. Into him, into him, according to, as per, in order to fit the meter, his own delight, that's God the Father's own delight, telematos autu, his own will and purpose. Telematos means will and purpose. And right here is when, I forget if it's Trajan or Hadrian, dies. I think it was Trajan. And then Hadrian um, gets the mantle. Okay, that's 117. Every time you see the word telematos, it occurs three times in Paul, in Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. Every time you get to the Ada here, there's an emperor who dies, and the guy who takes his place undoes what the previous em emperor wanted. It's really hysterical. Okay, so Paul is really timing his words. Okay, so this is 104 to 122 at the second ice. Peter knows that. Which is, I'm really grateful that Peter knows that because now I know I parsed it right because I kept on doubting myself when I parsed this. Peter's paralleling his ice claws to the ice claws here, the ice claws here, and the ice claws here. That's a pinon, but Peter's stopping just short of a pinon. He's going to mention it in the next verse. Okay? So that's really important to know. It's a parallel. So that tells you how to interpret it, okay? Because of Christ, see, here's the dia. Peter's referencing dia down here, so he's paralleling that section. You have to understand that that's meant. So if we were to read Paul first, like we've been doing as a pattern, to see the interleaving of the text, you'd say, because of Christ, into whom... Okay, into whom, according to the good pleasure of Father, his own will and purpose. That's that's in a positive. In other words, good pleasure is a positive to tutelemotosatu. Okay, his own will and purpose. This is this has got a connotation of official will, last will and testament. That's why using the Ada here by Paul was so pregnant. Because emperors when they died they left wills and testaments and who was supposed to be their heir and a bunch of other stuff okay so will and purpose think of that as will and purpose but think of it in a legal sense his own delight is his personal attitude dilemmatos is his, is his legal will okay so because of Jesus Christ into whom according to father's delight and as it were, we don't need to use the word chi here, his own will and purpose, his official, legal will and purpose, 
In other words, his official legal will and purpose is putting into effect his own delight. Okay, and then, so let, let's smooth it out again. Because of Jesus Christ, into him, according to Father's delight, his own official will and purpose, and we come down here, into the living hope, the living confident expectation, due to, see he's paralleling the first D up there, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, out from the dead ones. See, it's a full circle. It begins and ends with Jesus Christ. It begins and ends with him. See, dia here, dia here. All right? Ice here, going to the next ice, which is left in abeyance. Ice here. It's a paralleling. This is deliberate paralleling. The reader wouldn't miss this. Okay, if you knew your meter and you're reading in Greek, you wouldn't miss this. You'd notice the parallel because it's covering the same time period. It's covering the same syllable count. Okay, so now here's here's where it gets really kind of funky. Okay, and I think I'll reserve that for the next increment. So it looks like I'll split this into two. Because I gotta I gotta stop. But I gotta show you the example so you know how to do this on your own. What's remaining to be explained is why do we have these two timelines? Because it's the first time we have two timelines. See, up here, it's just Peter. But once you get to a new sevening, the way the meter works, when you get to a new sevening, if it's not the same number as what the other guy you're quoting is using, then what does it mean to set up two timelines? Daniel had done this in Daniel 9. It's very sophisticated. What do you infer from that? Okay, and I'll have to cover that in the next increment. And maybe I'll just append that increment to make that, uh, you know, a longer video. Okay, but I'm signing off for now.